Hi. <laughs> How are you? Um, my name is Alex Weinert. I'm the Director of Identity Security for Microsoft. And I'm Tia. I am a Program Manager. I report to Alex, and I look after our incident response programs within identity. All right. So um, we're here to talk about some of the uh, changing rules in identity security, uh, some of the attacks that we're seeing. And um, I'm looking forward to watching looks of horror as Tia tells you stories. <laughs> um, so I'm going to just start off just real quick with some context setting that I think is important. I'll go kind of quickly through this. Um, way back in 2018 in Boston, I think it was, um, between ZZ Auth rehearsals, I presented this slide. And it was basically saying that right now the real problems are around breach replay, password spray, um, and phishing attacks that are all password only. And if you did MFA, everything would get so much better. And uh, so this talk, of course, is all about the attacks that happen after that happens. And we've done great in four years. We've you know, moved overall MFA usage in our, in our measurable world up from uh, like just under 2%, which was pretty grim, to just under 25%, which we should face it is still pretty grim. Um, and as a result, we've uh, still got to deal with password spray, phishing, and you know, uh, reach replay. So, uh, so my main point of this is, I hate it when I, I do a talk like this and you're like, you talk about things like token theft and it's like, oh, I shouldn't even bother with MFA. You should bother with MFA. Do MFA. Okay. Um, everything else here is like really small potatoes compared to that stuff. All right, if we go back a year and a half, uh, solar winds, great fun. Uh, Tia was in the hiring process and we were waiting for background checks and boy, we wish she was on the team at the time. Uh, but it introduced a bunch of new talks that we talked about last year. Uh, or new attack techniques that we talked about last year. And the main point of this is, I'm not going to recap that talk, but the problem here is that everything that is cool and new in the attacker space very quickly becomes like commoditized. Red teams, you know, good ethical uh, researchers go and build these attacks into automation, check them into sharing repositories, and then script kitties pick them up and run them against you. Uh, so everything that was, you know, nation statey a couple years ago is now pretty mundane. Um, so if that's the attacker, then you, know, you have to be this, right? This is your defender. And in our world, uh, that's Tia. So Tia is the person who looks after all of the incoming attacks, events, every single thing that comes in and hits our security team. Uh, Tia runs the, the team that essentially handles that and runs the post-incident responses and all that stuff. So this is the proverbial horse's mouth. <laughs> and she's going to take you through some like really cool, scary stories. Uh, we're going to do four little vignettes to talk about some techniques we're seeing that it's good to be aware of, and uh, yeah, so it'll be scary. Yeah, and don't worry. Every time I say something scary, Alex is going to say something comforting. That's the agreement that we made before this talk to make sure that you all feel happy by the time that you leave. But like he said, we're going to do four of these, so we're just going to rip the rug right from underneath of you a couple of times before, before we go. So sorry about all that. All right, why don't you kick us it. off with our first story? <laughs> yeah, so we're going to start with recent history. Uh, March of 2022, so this year, and a tale of token theft. So Mystic, our threat analyst group within Microsoft, were tracking a known actor who were known to really punch through MFA at, uh, thank you, at companies with really, really good security practices. They were called Lapsus, a group of alleged teenagers who would extort companies and threaten to destroy their data. And they had a lot of tactics from social engineering, which we heard an amazing talk about this morning, to cred scaling and pretty much anything in between that you can imagine. And our ecosystem gave them an awful lot of help, as we showed earlier as well. But it's disturbingly cheap to be a baddie as well. So <laughs> back when I grew up in the UK, we had this thing called a penny tray. And it was at the local corner shop, and every piece of candy was exactly one penny, which was great if you're a kid and you get sent to the corner shop with 20p. That's actually quite a lot of sugar, and your parents probably regret it immediately afterwards. But if you're looking at this, 97 cents for a thousand creds. This is essentially the penny tray of the dark web at this point. It is horrifyingly cheap. And so we'd been tracking Lapsus for, for a while. And um, I also actually took this call outside of a crate and barrel at the U Village uh, when Lapsus declared that they had, they'd hacked us. And so the story changed. And it was really for us about how did they get in? How are we going to tell this story? And ultimately, it came down to one compromised user, just one person. And it was an age-old story. They had used Redline, cred stealer, Redline Password Stealer to take the creds, to duplicate the token, and they were in, and they were away. 
But again, it's about token theft as well. So what do we know about token theft? It's a major industry-wide issue for all of us. Um, in the past six months, we've detected about 150,000 instances of token theft and about 1.7 million infected devices with malware. And those are just in the customers that we monitor at Microsoft. So as promised, Alex is going to tell you something comforting now about what we're doing and what you can do to protect yourselves. Uh, so I'm going to start by just reiterating, we are a couple of orders of magnitude off in terms of relative threat of a password without MFA. So token theft at 150,000, we see a growing trend. It's a serious issue, especially if you're well protected. But if you're not running MFA, like start getting, you know, come to the party. It's fun. The water's fine. Uh, if you saw Ian's talk, it was awesome. Um, all right. So the first thing here around token Alex, theft. Microsoft. Thank you. <laughs> That's much better. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So uh, thanks, Justin. So uh, so a couple things. The first is uh, when we talk about token theft, there have been some publicized cases of it being via like a router or log files that are left around and, you know, like essentially having problems like that. But the vast majority of token theft is via malware. And uh, so, you know, device hygiene becomes kind of a tuple, right? Like we're not here to talk endpoint security per se, but we have to talk about endpoint security when we talk about identity now. Um, Second thing is that, uh, here's the good news, I'm supposed to be comforting. It's not my nature to be comforting, but um, I'm gonna try. So uh, you can detect stolen tokens largely with the same techniques you would use to detect stolen credentials. So you're seeing behaviors that are unusual, you're seeing locations that are unusual, and then you get the bonus of a stolen token showing up in two places at once, right? So uh, you know, being aware of that, and uh, there's some actually, I will pick on Sergio. Sergio developed some token theft detections uh, for us, so uh, it's very doable. He's nodding, so I'm not lying, I don't think. Um, <laughs> so uh, limit the use of stolen tokens uh, is what I'm gonna talk a little bit more about. Click. Um, so a couple things here. Um, demonstrated proof of possession is kind of our hope for being able to get to a place where um, we can essentially sign requests to the relying parties with, a, uh, and then essentially verify that request with a public key that's been issued with the token. And th that's like a very short <laughs> description of a very long thing. We did a whole talk on that at RSA. But uh, that is sort of the long game, right? Is like get to a place where we actually don't have to worry about it so much because we make them useless when stolen. Um, the second thing that's kind of worth thinking about, and this can help us now, is, uh, go ahead, shared signals. Um, so the shared signals and events framework is another kind of cool thing that allows relying parties and IDPs to talk to each other, which is like shocking, right? Instead of, hey, let's wait for an hour before we talk again, um, we can actually have a conversation which allows for real-time revocation. So when we do that token theft detection, we can then trigger an event that can result in the revocation of the token, right? So that we get a little bit of protection there. So there's hope on the horizon today, really watching out for malware and monitoring for stolen tokens. All right. So. Here's the thing, the lapsus attack, um, if anyone is at EIC, I kind of rode this joke to death, but uh, the, uh, the lapsus attack was done at least partially by kids, right? And it's important to protect children, I think, so we want to make it harder for them to do criminal acts so that they stay out of jail. Um, because, you know, after all, like, children are the future, right? If you teach them well, yeah. they will lead the way. Yeah, so, so. The, the great prophet, Whitney Houston. Um, all right. Yeah, so we're going to do another one. Um, and... I was not here for this story, as Alex mentioned. I was waiting for a background check to complete. I'm not bitter. Uh, incident FOMO is apparently a real thing. The equivalent of this for me, for SolarWinds, uh, was I, because I joined the month after, was essentially walking into a house party just as it's ending and someone handing you a trash bag and telling you all the stories of people dancing on tables and you're like, okay, or that's dancing great. Or uh, Well, that Christmas, too. But, yeah. <laughs> But essentially, I missed out big time, and I am kind of sad about it. But SolarWinds is a story that I know pretty well from the follow-up. So in this case, we know that the attacker was really focused on impersonating and corrupting apps. Um, because no one really pays attention to them once they're set up, which is really, really bad, because you should. An app gone sideways is responsible for data loss, credential loss. And because they're often highly privileged as well, they've got really terrible hygiene associated. And there are kind of four main ways that this can happen. The first one being service accounts. So service accounts in a number of instances, you know, they can have really funny names. People have put their creds somewhere in a Word document. <coughs> Attackers are gonna go and hunt for things like that. So that's the first way that that can happen. And another instance as well is just to really go and look for repos where people have checked stuff in that they shouldn't have done. And 
you know, 2022 so far, there's about 4,000 app stuff that app related things that have been checked into GitHub that really shouldn't be there. So it's a bigger problem than we give it credit for. The third option is key insertion. So if the attacker gets admin on an IDP, put their own public key in, they're away. They can, they can impersonate it at will. And then finally, the one that we all know really well, which is compromise a dev environment, put some malicious code in the app, and you're away. So again, Alex? All right, so microphone. Um, <laughs> thank you. Uh, so the, the three things here, I think, um, you know, one of the big ones here is just monitoring um, for application credentials. And here, I really mean automated monitoring. So we have, uh, and most of you hopefully have, like something called CredScan or things like CredScan. So these are just automated processes that are scraping through your file repository, scraping through your document share, scraping through, you know, you're essentially grepping, right? You're just looking for the patterns that have to do with either certificates, keys, or passwords to make sure that those aren't getting out. And please do that, you know, preferably as part of your check-in process, right? If things are getting into, you know, it is shocking, it really is shocking that this year we have notified on 4,000 uh, applications where public, you know, creds were checked in uh, to GitHub in public repos. And so for a while there was just a foot race. Like we have now done some processes to kind of get an advantage in that foot race, but it used to be that the attackers were running scripts to monitor and we were running scripts to monitor. It's just who's ever scripts timed first on a given repository as to who got the cred first. So that's pretty cr uh, cruddy. And then if you have, a repo that's been around for a while, you have versioning, and we have seen attackers go back through the versions. Right? So you have to be pretty diligent about going through and making sure that you, you know, any creds that you've checked in in the past are no longer valid. Uh, fairly important. So the second thing is applications are people too, you know, in some ways. Like, we've been really focused on worrying about how people act in strange ways. Like they're, you know, they're doing the wrong query or their creds have been stolen, and mostly uh, we've been kind of fire and forget on the applications. But almost everything that a human can do wrong, an app can do wrong, right? You can get creds that are inserted that shouldn't be there. You can get uh, usage from the wrong location. And all these things are telling you that you have essentially an artificial credential or use of a, you know, somebody's impersonating the application. So query patterns change. Um, API, you know, usage patterns change. Any of those things are the same kind of stuff you'd be looking for for user behavior anomaly. It all works for applications too. So, you know, we have, uh, you know, the, sort of the principles of verify everything, assert least privilege access. That's great for apps too. Developers, I think Justin kind of touched on this, developers are going to say, hey, it's really inconvenient for me to develop this code under super restrictive permissions and have to keep bumping up against the wall and changing. So let me just make myself essentially God and then you know, go develop my stuff. But if you don't go back later and scope that down, you've got a serious problem, right? And so the attackers know this and they, they take good advantage of it. Um, and finally, like these environments where we set up credentials and set up applications, because they do tend to be fire and forget, make sure that those are secure environments. And so we're very hardcore and suggest you get hardcore in your environments about, like single sign-on is awesome and I love that people can like log into a Windows device and be on their domain and then just translate silently into the cloud and use their SaaS apps. And that's all great, unless you're an admin. And then like that, you know, that sort of pass the hash attack on-prem now results in all of your cloud environments being lost too, right? So isolation of these accounts is a good thing and you know, isolation of environments. We're pretty hardcore, we use SAW, um, fish-proof credentials, which are uh, like, like FIDO tokens. Uh, they, they're dual use, they're uh, FIDO and PIV. Um, and then we have like separate accounts and you know, everything is separate. And so that's not a bad way to go. All right, next scary story. Yeah, people aren't looking comforting. too concerned right now, but yeah. you're doing a very good I'm job not, at I'm comforting not. people, I will say. It's gonna be fine, it's gonna be fine. <laughs> So before we talk about what happened in January of 2022, we're gonna go back a little bit further uh, to the summer of 2020. And this was around a time when one, I don't remember that summer, I think it would just sort of skip over it in our brain thanks to being in lockdown and other things. But back in the summer of 2020, we started getting customer reports of apps that were you know, impersonating Microsoft applications. And you know, there was domain impersonation, they were using logos, it all looked very legit. But unfortunately, what it was trying to encourage people to do is give overprivileged consent and give you know, attackers read-write access to their entire profile. So back then we did a huge push to clean up these apps, get rid of them, and also do a massive uh, initiative around getting you know, verified publishers uh, as well. So you knew that what you were consenting to. Unfortunately, in 2022, earlier this year, we saw another spike in some Twitter traffic telling us that there were malicious applications again, but this time they were publisher verified. So 
We spun up another case. We started looking into this again. And lo and behold, we're back to the beginning. We're back to the same story when it comes to phishing. We know that, you know, 2022, IBM released a report saying four out of 10 attacks start with phishing. And Avalon in 2021 said that about 5% of all emails were phishing. So back to the very beginning. However, in this case as well, we've got the added complication of the fact that the threat actor was compromising administrators who didn't have MFA turned on. Mm, can say many things that we're not gonna say, but they were compromising administrators that didn't have MFA turned on, registering themselves as a user, going then and elevating to global admin and turning on MFA. So at least the attacker listened to us when we said turn on MFA, but that's not the point and I'm not gonna dig into that. So, <laughs> They're listening. So the next thing that they did was they, re they registered this malicious application. And the next stage then was really also quite straightforward. Because they had compromised a customer who had a reputation with us already, they had a billing history, they had all sorts of, of stuff that they could rely on, they used that to then sign up for Microsoft Partner Network, pass one bet, get the verified tick on that malicious application, and then we're back to the same story again. We start with the email-based phishing to get into people's environments, get people consenting to these applications, call the API, get access to as much data as physically possible. And this actor that we know about, this one actor that we, that we were tracking, registered about 37 malicious applications uh, from about 14 tenants that they had compromised. So they were quite prolific in a, in a short period of time. And um, All right. comforting words. Okay, we're gonna ignore the 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 versioning error on the slide. Um, so the, uh, right, we're all gonna ignore it. Uh, so very quickly, you know, the first thing is that uh, app provenance matters. And so when you think about uh, people being allowed to self-consent to applications in an environment, it's kind of a bummer if you don't know who the publisher is, you don't know where it came from. So app provenance becomes important. So you can allow self-consent. Uh, most folks will allow you to sort of say what publishers you trust, or at least that it's a verified publisher. Uh, so that's important. For admins, don't let admins self-consent. Like, it's just way too sketch. So uh, the permissions you can consent to if you're a user might be like mail, you know, read, write, or, you know, contact, like, let me see your contacts. But for admins, it can be things like, you know, vm.delete. And so it just depends on what permissions are there. And so I'd say for admins, it's not a really healthy idea. Um, and then, you know, B, this is sort of the standard thing about these are my prairie dogs. Watch for things, right? Like application, again, application usage. Uh, if you see an application gaining huge exponential traffic in your organization, um, and especially downloading tons of data, that's probably, you know, at least worth looking at, uh, and probably actually terrible. Um, yeah, bad apps get popular, I don't know. All right, take us home. All right, last story. And this is my favorite one that I get to end on, because like I said, I'm not bitter and I don't have FOMO over missing solar winds. I'm just gonna hammer that home so everyone knows that I'm definitely not bitter, because why would, that's not fair. Anyway, October 2021 and Olfo returned. Um, and I finally got to join the party in one way or another. So, um, Nobelium came back. And one thing that Nobelium really liked to do when they attack is to go after delegated admins. So, what they do is they look for people who have a trusted relationship and abuse that relationship that people have with their customers. And so for them, it's a matter of getting access to those delegated admin vendors. And this was tried and tested techniques, things that we all know and see every day. So malware, password spray, spear phishing, token theft, the list goes on, the same things that we talk about. And in this case, they were targeting individuals, like I said, with admin privileges. And what they were doing is they were going into Active Directory, into Azure Active Directory, and they were changing the directory or consenting to apps so that they could maintain their persistence. But at this point, the story is pretty sad because if you've got a delegated admin that's been compromised, whoever they have access to as a downstream customer is likely also popped. So it's a fairly significant problem to get into and it's a fairly significant problem to try and resolve. We did say we'd end on comforting words and these are the final comforting words, I promise. All right, uh, I will try to be comforting. So the main thing here is that you have some power. Um, the, the concern, you know, is that with delegated administrative uh, environment. So where you have a vendor who is essentially providing you some kind of, admin, like maybe they're doing index management or some other kind of maintenance in the organization. They have usually a lot of privilege and if you're not paying attention to like how they run their shop, that can be a serious problem. So I will say that the, the, the vendors that were targeted by Nobelium in many cases had really horrifying security practices. So for example, they might do MFA, but there's like, 
you know, one phone that they all share to do the MFA, right? Uh, or um, in some cases, you'd see like federation servers configured to always return that claim, right? So, um, you know, even where MFA was showing up, it was not great. And so I think that, you know, these are people that take your money and you get to ask hard questions about what they're doing in terms of their security practices. I think you can go farther than that. Obviously, you want to monitor not just as much as your own admins, but more than your own admins. Right, because these are people with essentially less, presumably less loyalty to the organization. Also, very often uh, are running, you know, automation scripts and kind of doing very broad operations. So it's good to pay attention to what the admins are doing. Um, and then finally, you know, look at uh, doing your own enforcement. So very often in these guest accounts, you can just sort of say, look, there's a local account here, and we're going to enforce our own policies on it. Um, but I think that, you know, again, there are things you can do. The main admonition here is please be aware of the upstream relationships. And you know, I think that until we get more structure in the industry about standardizing like what the security promises are from vendors, uh, it's going to be on us individually to kind of help out with that. Um, all right. Final words of wisdom to you? Final words of wisdom. So we are here to help out, as everybody in this room is. We want to make things easier and better for our customers. So you know, the, the main takeaway points here, you know, token theft, check everything. Make sure that you understand what's going on in your in your environment with app hijacking monitor your app credentials with everything that you can consent phishing check what you can consent to what you are consenting to and what the users in your environment are consenting to as well and when it comes to delegated admin takeover please monitor guest activity as well um, there was a note on the bottom of this and for those of you at the, at the back of the room who probably can't see there was a massive banner on the other version that said please mfa that goes without saying of course but thank you very much for your time and for for coming listening to us. We hope you feel like there's there's ways to, to solve these problems and enjoy the rest of Identiverse. Right on.